Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Queen Elizabeth, A Day in Her Life. When we last left the King and Queen, the Queen gave an inspiring radio speech to the ladies. They had been keeping things going on at home, and there was a visit from Eleanor Roosevelt to Buckingham Palace, and she got to see what was going on in England as they were being attacked. Eleanor loved how inspired the people were and was shocked by the devastation the bombs had caused. So let's see what's happening today. The Queen was worried about the precious artwork that they had could be destroyed in the German attacks. In 1940, she has suggested that the valuable paintings be sent to Canada disguised as luggage for Lord Athlone, the Governor General. The idea was dropped on government advice, and the pictures were stored in the basement of Windsor Castle. In 1942, Owen Morshead arranged for the priceless collection of drawings, miniatures, and manuscripts from the Royal Library to be moved to the National Gallery store in a disused mine in North Wales. At the King and Queen's request, the most precious paintings were dispatched there, too. The defeat of the Germans and the Italians in North Africa gave the King an opportunity. He wanted to visit his armies in the field. Any such trip made the Queen nervous, but she agreed that it was important, and he had not been in the field since visiting the British Expeditionary Force in northern France at the beginning of the war. He discussed the idea with Churchill, and he agreed. King prepared for the worst, leaving instructions that, should he not return, the Queen must take the entire charge of and go through all his personal papers. They were locked in various boxes in Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle, and Royal Lodge. Only the Queen should read his diaries, which should then be placed in the Royal Archives. On June 11th, the King left Northhold Aerodrome, and he traveled under the name General Lyon. He then went on a converted Lancaster bomber, which Churchill used. The Queen waited anxiously at the palace. At 8.15 a.m., she learned that the plane had been heard near Gibraltar, and a half hour later, she was told that the thick fog had prevented the plane from landing there. They decided to fly to Africa. There was then complete silence for more than another hour. Queen Elizabeth was frightened. She said to Queen Mary, Of course I imagined every sort of horror, and walked up and down my room, staring at the phone. Then she heard her husband had landed in Algiers, from there, the king sent a wireless message to the queen, arrived safely after pleasant flight, all well. Lovely hot weather, interesting program arranged. Eisenhower and others dine Saturday. Others come tonight. Three French generals lunch today. Best love. The queen replied that she was thankful that he had a comfortable journey. She said she was counting the days until he returned. She said, I do hope that the warm sun will do you good and that the change of everything will be a real tonic. I'm sure you badly need it after these four years of grinding work and anxiety. Lilibet was down with a cold, and Margaret had gone to Frogmore to help the Sea Rangers, and that's the nautical section of the Girl Guides, cook their lunch. She said that I think of you all the time, and do pray that you will have a really interesting and not too exhausting time. All my love, darling, from your loving E. The King's Journey made the sort of headlines the Queen loved to see. On the day it was announced, the Queen was almost mobbed by enthusiastic crowds in the East End who swarmed over her car. The King's guide for much of the trip was Harold Macmillan, Britain's Prime Minister resident at the Allied Forces headquarters in North Africa. Macmillan thought palace officials had failed to set priorities well and had done too little to include the Americans in the King's trip. Macmillan managed to correct that in the course of his grueling two-week trip, and the King met Eisenhower and gave a garden party for British and American officers and visited GIs in one of their camps. More time, of course, was spent in the British Eighth Army, and the King knighted General Montgomery in his recognition of his triumph at El Alamein. Like others who were with him, the King suffered throughout the trip from what he called Jippy Tummy and lost nearly a stone, but he was very happy with what he was able to do. The most important and most dangerous part of the trip was his visit to Malta. It had suffered ruthless bombing and blockades by Axis forces for over two years. The islanders held out, and in April 1942, the king had awarded his personal decoration, the George's Cross, to the people and the garrison of the island. This helped the morale of the islanders, but their ordeal continued after the Rommel's defeat. The king was determined to go to the island. The king's advisors and his wife were nervous about the idea. Sicily was only 60 miles to the north, and it was still in fascist hands. The king prevailed. He traveled by sea and by night from Tripoli 
on the cruiser HMS Aurora. June 20th, the news of his imminent arrival was announced on the island. The church bells burst into ringing. Thousands of people rushed to the harbor side to cheer with wild abandon. The king looked elegant in his white uniform, stood and saluted in front of the bridge as the aurora drew near. The cheering went on and on, and the king told his mother, It brought a lump to my throat, knowing what they suffered from six months of constant bombing. At the end of the emotional day, perhaps one of the most important in his reign, the lieutenant governor, David Campbell, said to the king, You have made the people of Malta very happy today, sir. And the king replied, But I have been the happiest man in Malta today. While the king was gone, the queen acted as chancellor of the state and fulfilled some of the king's duties. Since the king would miss his usual Tuesday meeting with Churchill on June 22nd, she invited the prime minister to lunch with her alone. Churchill had been given instructions that the queen be kept fully informed of all the events while the king was away. The queen wrote the king that she had only had to sign four little ERs on the documents requiring the monarch's signature and hoped she had not let him down. The king had a calm and comfortable flight back from Fez to North Holt, where he landed at 6 a.m. It was June 25th, and he was an hour ahead of schedule. Churchill met him, and they talked about the trip while they drove together to Buckingham Palace. The king recorded in his diary, I found Elizabeth in bed waiting anxiously for me. It was lovely seeing her again. She has had very little sleep, and it was then only 7 a.m. The trip was a huge success. There was only one happy thing that happened with the trip. Problems arising from the journey caused the final break between the king and his private secretary, Alec Hardin. Alec Hardinge. He had served him since he came to the throne. Hardinge was a fine man with outstanding qualities. He was a one-time assistant private secretary to King George V in 1920, and he was also private secretary to King Edward VIII, but had quickly recognized the king's inadequacies. Hardinge wasn't an easy man, and under the pressures of war, his relationship with the king, who wasn't easy either, became strained. The queen and others in the royal family felt that the king needed a private secretary who was more compatible with him. While the king and Hardinge were in Africa, the queen talked it over with Tommy LaSalle, the king's assistant private secretary. LaSalle wrote in his diary that for some years, he had been the unwilling target of Hardinge must go barrage inside the Buckingham Palace from the king and queen downwards. LaSalle came to realize that Hardinge and the king were so temperamentally incompatible they were driving each other crazy. Hardinge became more isolated and less able to delegate. His colleagues found him impossible, according to, according to Macelles. This reached a climax at the time of the African journey. Lascelles considered that Hardinge had failed to give him sufficient briefing of or authority to conduct business properly during the king's absence. Lascelles, when he came back, protested, and the two men exchanged bitter letters. Lascelles threatened to resign, prompting Hardinge, who was exhausted and in poor health, to write to the king on July 6 to resign. The king was surprised but relieved. In his diary, he noted, I, I replied, accepting his resignation, as I was not altogether happy with him. He told Tom Lascelles he wanted him to become his private secretary. Hardinge was upset by the king's brisk action. The next morning, he asked the king if he really wanted him to resign. The king said he did, and that he was grateful for all he had done for him the last seven years. The king said it was difficult to do it, but he knew the opportunity wouldn't come again. The king wrote in his diary that it came as a real shock to him, and he could see it. Many members of the household believed that the queen played a large part in Hardinge's re at Hardinge's removal. The queen knew more than anyone the tension that existed between Hardinge and the king. She sought anything that could help improve the king's peace of mind. Hardinge's wife, Helen, who had been close to the queen since girlhood, was hurt. She wrote to the queen, I am not distressed about Alex's resignation, which looks right to me, but I am sad of what had led to it. She said that she had been told by trustworthy people that the queen had been trying to get rid of her husband for a long time. I do not know whether it is true or not. If by any chance it should be, your majesty only had to send for me and tell me what you thought. The queen immediately sent for Lady Hardinge, who recorded in her diary July the 8th, went to see the queen. She was very angry at me for believing they could have wished it ill for Alec. July 17th, the palace issued a statement saying that Hardinge had resigned on grounds of ill health and that the king had appointed Sir Alan Lascelles in his place. 
It was to be a close and fruitful relationship, and Queen Mary was thankful. The king and queen and the princesses went to Appleton and then paid a visit to her father at Gloms and then went to Balmoral. The queen was happy to invite friends to stay for the first time during the war. They invited Barberly Craborne's wife, Betty. It was a happy holiday, and the queen tried to prolong the stay for the princesses so they could have as much fresh Scottish air as possible to fortify them against another cold winter at war. Lady Cranborne brought her new popular gramophone record coming in on a wing and a prayer, and it made the princesses weep a little every time they played it. By the third quarter of 1943, Allied victories were more frequent. The Red Army was forcing the Germans on the Eastern Front, Mussolini was overthrown, and Italy changed sides. There were growing tensions among the Allies. Churchill was concerned about Stalin's post-war ambitions in Europe, a concern that Roosevelt didn't always share. Roosevelt was Churchill's great friend, and he now imagined he could create an equally trusting relationship with Stalin. To Churchill's dismay, he now found himself the odd man out among the big three, Roosevelt, Stalin, and himself, and he shared his fears with the king and queen. It wasn't easy for the queen to combine her wartime duties with her responsibilities to and love for her daughters. She wasn't able to spend much time with them except for weekends. There was another reason she had always dedicated herself to supporting her husband since the abdication, and it was an even stronger priority for her, and she felt her place was by his side as wife and queen. She was aware of how difficult it was to grow up in a nation at war, and she did all she could to preserve the normal pleasures of childhood. The queen thought there were similarities between her own life among the soldiers at Gloms in the First World War and that of her daughters, particularly Princess Elizabeth, at Windsor now. She stated that Lilibet meets young grenadiers at Windsor, and then they get killed. At Christmas 1943, the princesses were heavily involved in Aladdin. Costumes were conjured up from old curtains and blackout material. Princess Margaret was now 13, and she was mischievous and provocative. Tommy LaSalle told the queen that one of the other dancing partners had enjoyed her company greatly, but had been embarrassed by her freewheeling gossip. The queen thanked him, saying he should not hesitate to tell her such things, even if it is something I don't like. If it is said kindly and tactfully, I shall never mind. Princess Elizabeth was grown into a poised, serious, but open young woman. In the early 1942, the king appointed Princess Elizabeth colonel of the Grenadier Guards who were protecting the family at Windsor. She took a great interest in the regiment. On her 16th birthday, she inspected a regimental parade in the quadrangle at the castle. The princess was also showing signs of interest in Prince Philip of Greece, and this was a friendship about which her family had concerns, and one of them being that the princess was a little young. <laughs> so I'm going to end the video here. In the next episode, we'll learn a little bit about Prince Philip and how Princess Elizabeth's parents felt about him, and we'll also find out more about the king and queen as the war is getting closer to ending. It's interesting to find out where the royals put their valuable paintings and works of art during the war, and I'm glad they did everything to preserve the works of art. The king took a trip to see his armies and to give the local people a morale boost, and it worked. And it meant a lot to the king, too. The king and his private secretary parted ways. They were not able to work well together. And when his secretary thought of resigning, the king jumped on the opportunity. It caused friction between the queen and her friend Helen, who was Alec Cartage's wife. The queen felt bad about not spending enough time with the princesses. She saw them on the weekends, but she felt it was her duty to stand by her husband and help him in his duties, especially when he had to step up to be king when his brother, King Edward VIII, stepped down. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, if you could give it a thumbs up, it would be greatly appreciated, and it'll help out the channel. I just wanted to mention that I created a list of merchandise from Amazon that I think some of you might be interested in and if you click on the link it takes you to the Amazon page and if you purchase something I get paid a small commission that is of no extra cost to you but more importantly I wish everybody a good day and tune in again soon for another episode of Queen Elizabeth a day in her life thank you bye